to plan your day The mountains are calling you out to play Come on, we'll make you feel right at home Good day, Belle, good day, Belle Let's see what lies in store for you There's so many things to see and do Summer, winter, spring or fall You're home in the Rockies as it all So gear up ready to plan your day the ideas are brewing you're on your way the fun is waiting outside your door good day Bill. good day Bill. welcome to good day Vale. and today we have a great episode in store for you and thank you so much to our host at matsuhishu here in the Vale village my name is Cece Zach, and I am the host of the show Good Day Vale, a show that's dedicated to help you live your best life in Vale. Today's episode is actually dedicated to a category of spirits that is taking over the United States by storm. Matter of fact, in 2023, it is projected that this category of spirits is going to surpass vodka sales in the United States. In addition, the category itself is growing in leaps and bounds, and we are here today to learn about Mezcal. And to help us learn about Mezcal, I am very blessed to have with me John McAvoy, who is an entrepreneur, venture capitalist, and Mezcal enthusiast, as well as Andreas Hall, who is a sommelier and a wine and beverage manager here at Matsuhishu. Stay tuned, we'll be right back for the Mezcal episode. Good day, Bill. Good day, Bill. Good day, Bill. Good day, Bill. Welcome back to the Mezcal episode at Good Day Vale. And today we have John and Andreas. Uh, thank you, Mezcal enthusiasts and a uh, wonderful breadth of knowledge. Um, and before we get into Mezcal, I'd love to learn and tell our viewers a little bit about why you've been in Vail and why you stay here. How long have you been here and why you stay here? John? Sure. So um, I've been in Vail over 10 years. We typically are, we, I live in New York, but we're typically spending three to four months a year here. And we just love Vail. We enjoy the summer the most. Um, I love the fish. I love the bike, being outdoors, hiking, running, all those things. And uh, that's what's kept me here. And also it's my understanding that Vail has lacked a mezcal enthusiast. So I'm trying to bring that to my role here in Vail. Well, and as I understand, because your wife is a very good friend of mine, matter of fact, we're college roommates, that you also got married in Colorado, but in yes. Aspen, but Correct. you chose to come here to the Vail Valley to live. Correct. Yeah, Vail just has so much more to offer. We love Aspen, we've had a, a great experience there, but I just feel that we feel Vail has so much more to offer. The breadth of the valley, the level, level and number of activities, um, the retail, the restaurants, everything is just, uh, it, it's a much greater impact here in Vail than in some of the smaller uh, towns in Colorado. All right, Andreas, how long have you been here for? I'm um, going on year 20. Wow. Um, so I moved here in 2003 after tourism hotel management school and uh, from Salzburg, Austria originally. And uh, really I was able to stay and fell in love with the valley and, and everything it's got to offer. And I'm very excited to still be here after 20 years. And, um, be part of Matsuhisa, be part of uh, a great community and enjoy the great outdoors and, and uh, try to provide the best service we can um, to our friends and family who come visit us. Speaking of friends and family, the two of you got to know each other through the spirits of Mezcal. So tell us a little bit about your interests. How did you get involved in this wonderful beverage? Um, I'll, I'll start and then that'll bring the intersection of, of Andreas and I together. So I, I traveled the road from tequila and I was a, a long-standing tequila drinker and Mezcal showed up kind of in the you know 2000s, mid 2000s and when I first tasted it I was just blown away. I was like what is this? What's going on? It was so complex, so interesting and I started to learn more and more about Mezcal. I had the unique opportunity to invest in this brand, Illegal Mezcal, over 10 years ago and that just accelerated my interest in the category. I started learning as much as possible about Mezcal. And yeah. let me just interject that John is also probably the most widely educated <laughs> and is educating all of us. He has two books out on Mezcal. I don't think there's any other author that does, so sorry to interrupt, John. No, that's quite right. There's a lot of people that know way more about Mezcal than me, but they haven't written a book. So I, I put it down on paper, and I did that because I wanted people to know and understand this category because Mezcal 
is so special to me. And when people understand it, they just appreciate it. They have a reverence for it, which it deserves with a deep culture and history. So I wanted to put that in writing. I wanted to help educate people about Mescal. And then about, about almost 10 years ago, I met Andreas because I came in here with Illegal uh, as now an investor with our distributor. And you can take it from there. Uh, so I, I, I'll say quite open and honestly, I wasn't always the biggest fan of Mezcal. Right? When you get into it, it is a, uh, it's a distillate that I now find delicious. But the first ver versions of it that I was introduced to, very extremely smoky, kind of rural, old school, classic um, versions that you probably, you know, it's hard to start off like that. And, and John brought by Illegal Mezcal, and I remember this was in 2012 or 2013, I believe. And I think my reaction was, I'm like, wow, this is the first Mezcal I've ever liked, right? Yeah. Um, so it got me excited that there is a really interesting spirit with what I think, you know, there's a lot of great heritage, there's a great story to it, it's very artisanal and all of the above, something that you may not get out of some other, um, you know, areas of, of, the, of the spirits world. And uh, so, yeah, he, he's really at fault for getting me excited about Mezcal. <laughs> I take full blame and appreciate that uh, I was able to <laughs> bring, bring it to Matsu. And also to your credit, as you've heard me say, you were one of the first people in Vail, first establishments in Vail, to carry Mezcal. And you know you recognize the uniqueness of the product. Um, none of us knew what it would be today, which has right. traveled tremendous uh, roads of success. But you were one of the first. And Andreas, as we were preparing for this episode, you said that you actually started a cocktail um, with mezcal in it that actually had different spirits in it before. Tell us a little bit about that cocktail. So it's it's called the Gardener cocktail, which uh, f to full credit, one of our bartenders Jeff came up with um, in 2012. I think it's one of the early cocktails, and um, it's 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 become a thing in Vail, right? There's a there's a lot of it's, ma a, it's it, magic. It's, it's got. It should have his own Instagram account. <laughs> it <right>? does. <laughs> Follow the gardener. It does. Um, and then John came in, of course, with his love and passion for mezcal. He ordered one in a mezcal version, and we went, "Wow, this is really, really delicious." And so, um, in fact, about 15% of all of our gardener cocktail sales are now um, made with illegal mezcal, which wow. was not the case wow. in 2012 and 2013. So that's evolved yeah. tremendously. I, uh, the, the cocktail is so incredible. I wrote a full blog post about yeah, yeah, yeah. the gardener uh, giving credit to Matsuhisa, of course, with the recipe because it's just it's an amazing cocktail. Yeah. So, you, so you mentioned that 15% of uh, the gardener is made with mezcal. Can you tell us a little bit how you've seen mezcal being drunk over the years, um, going from maybe being in a cocktail for people to, to start drinking it, and then how many people drink it neat now? So the, uh, the amount of people who drink it neat has risen dramatically um, but the gateway um, into mezcal is certainly still cocktails right just like yeah. it is with most spirits um, I don't think anybody really sits down and drinks a bourbon neat when they start drinking bourbon right it's usually through a Manhattan or an old-fashioned or anything along those lines and for us it's the gardener it's the vehicle and people really love the complexity of it and as they grow accustomed to drinking mezcal they have now experimented with different um, other brands and, and, and uh, 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 offerings that we, that we have at Matsuhisa, and we see a lot more people drinking them neat at this point, for sure. So John, tell us a little bit about the background of Mezcal. Um, yeah. As you were educating me, uh, Mezcal is made from an agave plant, and yes. agave is actually the umbrella of the category. Correct. Help educate our viewers sure. more. <laughs> so when you mentioned that um, the agave spirit, the category that is about to surpass vodka, uh, in terms of uh, U.S. sales is agave spirits. So agave spirits is the broad category uh, that includes tequila. Of agave spirits, tequila is about 97% of the category. Mezcal is about 3% of the category. But what's unique about mezcal is the way people are making mezcal today is the same way people have been making mezcal for 400 years. The process- 400 for years. 400 All right, years. viewers, it's been around for a long time. <laughs> it, it has. And when you go down into, into Mexico and rural Mexico and you see the way it's made, you would understand that. You would understand that, man, not much has changed because if you start to industrialize the making of mezcal, the taste, the profile, it'll be ruined. So setting aside the history and the culture, that'll be completely bastardized. But just the, the taste profile will change dramatically if you try to put it into a industrial setting. Now, 
quickly on what makes mezcal different than tequila. So tequila has to be made with the blue agave, only one type of agave. Mezcal can be made with any other type of agave from which you can make a distillate. Now, it's, uh, it's a number that is impossible to determine, but it's somewhere probably 60, 70, 80 different types of, mezcal, of agave from which you can make a mezcal. And I've probably had at least that many varietals. But because it's so regional and made in little towns and little villages, it's hard to pin down exactly how many. Uh, but there are specific rules about mezcal versus tequila, and some of those have to do with the production process, which is what gives mezcal a unique taste profile. Some of it is the regions from which you can make mezcal, and then the source material is the agave plant. So it's the agaves, it's the production process. Um, those are the key things that really, and where it's made in Mexico, those are the key things that differentiate mezcal from tequila. Then you can, as we get into it deeper, you can certainly talk more about the cultural elements around mezcal because those are the things that really bring a lot of uh, uniqueness to the spirit. And what do you call someone that makes mezcal? We'll get into production in a second, but sure. is it a mezcal mezcalero? Mezcalero. Me mezcalero, and um, they are made, mezcal is made on a palenque. And a palenque, it, it doesn't quite translate, but it's kind of like a farm, okay. is how it would translate. And it really is a distillery. But calling the places where mezcal is made, for the most part, saying it's a distillery is way too glamorous <laughs> from the reality of okay. what you're seeing. I mean, these people don't have a lot of resources and they make do with what they can. And sometimes you walk into a palenque and you'll be like, I can't believe they're gonna make something here that I'm actually gonna drink. Ah. And, and then, <laughs> well, I know we have photos on that. So I'm yeah. gonna ask you to right. hold that thought because sure. um, we are gonna take a quick break and I would ask that you come back and watch Good Day Vale and stick with us um, with John and Andreas to learn more about this fabulous category of spirits. Cheers. Good day, Bill. Good day, Bill. Good day, Bill. Good day, Bill. Welcome back to Good Day Vale. My name is Cece Zach, and I'm here with John McAvoy and Andreas Harl, and we are talking about Miss Cal. Uh, when we left the last segment, we were talking about production. But before we get into production, you mentioned the word artisanal. And yes. I probably didn't pronounce it correctly, but maybe you can help us understand how that sure. relates to mezcal. Sure. So artisanal is the right way to say it. And by the way, if you're buying mezcal, look for the word artisanal on the bottle because artisanal is actually a regulated. Is it on one of these bottles? It's on all, all of them. them. Okay. Correct. Yes. Um, it has to say it. Well, the premium mezcals have to say it, but it's part of the regulations. So mezcal, it's actually. Um, a term in the regulations, artisanal, ancestral, is it also one that you would be happy to buy. If it says neither artisanal nor ancestral, then you don't probably want to buy that mezcal because it means it's an industrial mezcal. All these here and most of what you'll find, certainly in the Vale Valley, at the bars and restaurants and liquor stores, is all going to be artisanal or ancestral production. Um, but importantly, what does that mean, right? What does artisanal mean? So basically, mezcal is a very handcrafted spirit. And again, if you if you aren't doing it in that fashion, it's not gonna taste any good. But the reason it it's, takes so long to produce mezcal and the reason mezcal is a relatively expensive spirit is because it's not from plant, harvesting a plant to in your bottle in 24 hours. Like you said, a lot of, you told me it's a month. It can be as, as long as a month wow. from harvest through the, the roasting the agave to the crushing of the agave to the fermentation to the distillation, that whole process can take as long as a month in mezcal. So it's a, it's a laborious process, it's a small batch process, and therefore it's an artisanal process. Now, Andreas, you, when we were preparing for this, mentioned that you kind of can equilibrate this to the wine industry as well. No doubt, and I think that's what interests most of us who run beverage programs. A big focus of what we do is wine, right? But the, uh, the fun part in mezcal is that it's very different from vodka, tequila, bourbon production because you meet and, and, and see all these small, tiny little productions and it really, what excites us after doing this for a long time is small production wineries, small production mescaleros, right? We don't necessarily get super excited about a product that you can find at every single liquor store. You want to get people excited about um, something somebody made who really truly cares and has passion for it without it being a commercialized product at all and so you know when we look at a lot of wine lists around we, we, we try to always get these small producers and tell their story and 
you know, obviously John's passion really relates to that because he's met a lot of these guys and, and so he's, a, he's like the greatest advocate for it just because, <laughs> you know, meeting these people and seeing what they do um, is, is special and, and uh, not all of it always being available is just as special um, in, in the same token. And, right? and I think when, when we met, one of the things that drew you to Mescal was the complexity of the spirit. And you were then, and I'm sure even now, have even a broader cat, uh, um, vocabulary around it. But talk about how the complexity of Mescal versus the complexity of wine on the palate and how that has further drawn you into Mescal. No doubt. I mean, there isn't, I don't think there's a, a spirit out there in, a, in its category that differs so much. Right? You have mezcals that are extremely approachable, that are almost not smoky at all. Yeah. You have mezcals that are vegetal on the nose. You have mezcals mm. that are fruity on the nose. You have mezcals that taste like the peatiest scotch mm. that you've ever had. Right? Yeah. So <laughs> I don't know that there is a broader range of, of, uh, of any category out there than mezcal. And so it intrigues us. Right? It, it, it's fun for the, uh, for the bartenders to, to uh, kind of implement it into their cocktail programs. And it's really fun for people because you're not getting this homogenized product, right, where it all tastes the same. And I think that's the, right. that's the most interesting part right. about mezcal to me. Even among these four bottles that we have here, if we could pour them on air and drink them on air. No, you, no drinking on I air, John. I understand, <laughs> I, it, it, it will stop me, but barely. Um, I think that you can try, even with these four bottles, you could try the range of taste profiles in these four, and you would think, are these the same spirit? Because yeah. they, it's so broad, exactly what he's saying, and you get that it's really unique to the Mescal world. Right. So I am assuming then that we're not going to see Randy Gerber or George Clooney <laughs> or Costa Amigos getting into mm -hmm. this because you said it's artisanal, it's yeah. small batch. They're looking for big commercial. Um, am I inaccurate, <laughs> accurate in that assessment? Well, it's funny you should ask because George Clooney has a Mescal oh, already. Boy. All right, I'm inaccurate. Okay. <laughs> and it's under the Costa Amigos brand, All so, right. the, so they have you know three tequila expressions and a Mezcal expression, and there have been a few other celebrity brands in Mezcal. I think you will see more. Um, we view it in the, the Mezcal enthusiasts, first, we don't drink them as a general rule because they're, they, they're not choosing carefully who they choose to work with, which is unfortunate. That said, we view it as somewhat good for the category because it brings attention to the category and it's helping these small families who are producing this mezcal, it's helping them sell more, more mezcal. Uh, so that's a good fact. Okay. I think it's the, the, the good comes with the bad, right? So to speak. You want to yes. make it more popular. It is great that they have this exposure and it's it certainly from what I can read of what we sell and the, the enthusiasm behind mezcal is certainly driven to a certain extent by the small brands, but one, by, the, by the big brands. Um, but once people really start to dive into it, they end up with what we got in front of us today. Yeah. Well, and Andreas, you were mentioning too that buying is really important because these batches, these small batches you're talking about, don't last very long, do they? <laughs> it makes me chuckle when I look at the, uh, the back of one of these bottles. It's, uh, they're half bottles, A, and it's number like 36 one. out of 660. Yes. I don't know if um, we can. We, like see we were that saying yesterday all, when we were doing the run through, it's barely. Yeah. I mean, is it worth producing? Yes. I mean, it's, it's worth, worth producing. producing. <laughs> is it worth producing <laughs> magic in any quantity? 100%. The answer is yes. <laughs> from, a, from, a, from a business perspective, it's certainly, it's more difficult, right? Yes. Um, but that's what intrigues us, right? A lot of these, mm -hmm. these things we have in front of us, the Cuento Cuentos, for example, which we love, you know, there may be 36 to 48 bottles that travel per batch to Colorado. And yeah. if you don't snatch them up when they come in, they're gone and they'll yeah. be gone forever. And that's actually a beautiful thing because it lets you experience something else down the, down the road, which, yeah. which I think is fun, right? That's where we, again, relating it back to the wine world, I don't want to drink the same wine every single day. Um, a lot of people do, but I think there's a big world out there of mezcals, of wines, of bourbon and scotches that are to be explored and it's, it's fun to, to do it that way. Yeah, there's definitely a rule in the mezcal world that if you find a bottle that you love, you taste something that you really love, try to find another bottle immediately and put it away. Because as Andreas said, there might be only several hundred bottles produced, there might be a thousand bottles produced, but it's for the whole country and maybe export markets yeah. as well. So try to get your hands on the things you really love because that particular expression, uh, that release will be gone soon and yeah. they'll do another one the next month or year or whatever, but it's not gonna taste the same. Maybe better, maybe worse. 
So the two of you know the valley pretty darn well. So help our viewers understand where we might be able to buy some mezcal since it is not that easy to find yeah. or to buy. Yeah, well, most of the liquor stores in, in the valley have a mezcal. They don't necessarily have them all, but... But uh, one. But, but one, one. One brand of mezcal. It's expanding, Correct. though, from what yes. I've seen. I know Vale Fan Wines has certainly expanded mm -hmm. their production. It's just yes. one that I can name. Um, I know, you know, El Segundo, I know that they have a fairly big yes. uh, uh, mezcal program, obviously, right. works for them. So it really is, it's growing, right. no doubt. And you can find, I mean, it's, it's expanding. Yeah, and a lot of these bottles, I mean, some of these bottles in front of us here are like $200 bottles. You know, uh, this half bottle is about a $90 bottle for a half bottle. Um, and so going to a place like you mentioned El Segundo, they probably have the best mezcal selection in the valley and you can sort of try before you buy. You right. can go into a place like that, say, oh, let me try this, let me try that, and do a little sampling and then decide if you wanna buy it. And then also, um, in the Valley, I buy a lot of um, uh, mezcal online and have it shipped in. But places in the Valley, they'll find wines, um, Westvale liquor stores, Beaver liquors, Avon liquors, people have mezcal. They might not have a breadth of selections, but as Andreas said, it's growing. What about um, different bars that are offering cocktails with mezcal? Have you seen that grown over the last 10 years? Certainly, I mean, yeah. I, yeah. and particularly in New York, where you guys live most oh, yeah. of the time. But yeah. there's, oh, but there's, I was thinking here in the Valley. Yeah. Valley. Certainly, I, yeah. when, I, when I make the rounds, and we, we, there, there is cocktails being made with, with mezcal, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Almost every place, I think, has a mezcal cocktail on there at this point. That's right, on the menu. Usually, uh, most places have a mezcal cocktail. Um, six, seven, eight years ago, zero, uh, except for except for Matsuhisa, one, <laughs> one. Um, and now pretty much everybody does. And if not, they have mezcal, and the bartenders are usually fluent in mezcal because mezcal has been part and parcel um, with the rise of the cocktail movement because it is unique. So with that, uh, Andreas, I want to thank you so much for hosting us here at, and pronounce it for me so I get it right this time. <laughs> Matsuhisa. Matsuhisa. So thank you all um, for hosting us. Um, I will leave you all with this, is that um, mezcal is an acquired taste, but it really is a taste worth acquiring. So many thanks to, to John and Andreas for their knowledge as well, and thank you for turning into Good Day Vale. I am Cece Zach, and we hope that you will try mezcal very soon. Cheers again. Salute. Yes. <laughs> Good day, babe.